a lot of people they're like one machine, of like yeah. the, all the things and yeah, I, I yeah. think i get that i do get that i i would love for that to be the case but i think until we get the thunderbolt thing figured out it's going to be kind of hard to to make that the case mm -hmm. you know, can't even get the egp thing cool. figured out i'm um, sorry i think the for anyone just listening uh some of the lights went out sorry about that um my home assistant decided my tv needed to go off and, that and all the your audio down? Light. yeah it was like oh you're you should stop working now interesting i didn't know that i didn't turn that off before <laughs> we started i apologize about that that's so my you've done a lot of home relation stuff today. then i guess oh yeah i i definitely do but this one needs a little bit of work because it interrupted uh your episode here no so this is actually not... perfect uh, tell me about your home automation i've not even considered doing any of this what's that Oh, uh, you had no idea about what? Yeah, tell me what you've done. What, what you got going on? Yeah, let me go ahead and get the recording lights back on, and I will tell you all about it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Now they're back. All right. So it's it's a project that's kind of on pause right now, but mm -hmm. it's, it's mostly done. I would say it's probably like 80, 90% done. So I wouldn't say there's anything too amazing, but... Um, my cameras are automated with it for recording. Uh, Wake on LAN for the recording PC. So I guess that that's pretty cool. Like it's mostly lights, cameras. I automate when the lights go on, go off. I like to map things to the sunset, sunrise plus one hour usually works best for me. And some of the another thing I like that it, that I didn't know you could do. I found out you can hook it into PF Sense and Unify, so you could pull in information about devices and put automations on there. So. The way I did it was I liked, and I wish I could show it to you, but um, I like to keep everything simple. So mm -hmm. what I feel like when it comes to home automation is buy-in from people in your house is extremely important. If you make it annoying, they're never going to like it again. If you show them something complicated, they're done. Okay. You got one shot. It, it's got to be simple. So I basically figured out, and I'm sure this is in the documentation. I found this on accident. You can have sub pages when you hold or long tap on something in Home Assistant. You can actually have it go to another screen. So I can have one button that turns on the TV and the sound bar and the Blu-ray player all at the same time. So someone just has to hit that one button. But if somebody wants to control any of those devices individually, then they can long press on that same button. Then another menu comes up with all the individual controls. And uh, for that, I used an IR blaster to uh, copy all the remote code. So then it was able to operate pretty much everything in, in the rooms that I have. But um, there's a lot more that I want to do with it, but it's just with creating content, then I don't get a chance to go in and, and fix it. Um, case in point, my six o'clock turn the TV and the recording lights off thing, that's not supposed to happen when I'm occupying the room. So, mm -hmm. Well... But I could tell you what's more amazing than the uh, the home automation system, uh -huh. and that's my um, server automation system because this thing is insane. Okay. <laughs> if I do say so myself, it's an Ansible system with like 330 individual files in it currently, just to give you an idea of its size and mm -hmm. its scope. Okay. And it, I am going to be releasing it publicly. I just don't know exactly when. It, it should have happened by now. But I have like a really old version out there that's just so old that it's barely worth looking at. But essentially, I use Ansible Pool. I, I'm sure you've, uh, you've probably heard of it. Most people haven't. Ansible mm -hmm. Pool, have you used it? Uh, no, I've never messed around with it. It's the only way I'll use Ansible now. Mm -hmm. and, and I know a lot of people will roll their eyes when, when I say that. But when you have servers, laptops, and desktops, and you're managing all three with one Ansible um, you know, setup, essentially, mm -hmm. I call it NodeForge, which is my internal name for it. And it... it operates differently depending on which one it's on but the the problem is if i have like an ansible server my laptop's in my bag then i'm going to get errors that it can't configure my laptop well yeah my laptop's in my bag of course you can't get to it it's not supposed to be configured right now and that was kind of hard to figure out how to make make it so that it didn't care if something could be off or if something wasn't supposed to be off and it was that i needed to be alerted on it so with Ansible pool, I can give it a Git repository and say, run this local host. So it's just Ansible pool, I think it's dash uppercase U off the top of my head, and then a Git repository URL. And inside that repository should be a file named local.yml. And that's like the file it'll run. So every machine 
basically checks that out and runs it against themselves. But if you add the dash O option, it changes it to only if you have made a commit. So mm -hmm. it's not going to do anything unless you've actually made a commit to the Git repository. So you don't have Ansible jobs running over and over again when they don't need to be. You can make it so that you put you push a change out to your repository, and then all of your machines will download them and run them. And for me, that makes a lot more sense because you know my laptop in my bag. If I open it, then it's going to run the job as soon as it wakes up. That's fine. And then I use healthchecks.io to let me know if any of them haven't checked in in a long time. Then I could go in and find out. So that way, nobody can quietly fail either. And I think I've spent two or three years of an exclusively Ansible pool. Wow. Uh, for anyone and, who doesn't know, uh, just a quick explanation of what Ansible is. Oh, for, for me, yeah. So Ansible is a configuration management solution similar to Chef and Puppet, but where it really excels is that it's much more lightweight, whereas with Chef and Puppet, you have an agent that you install, you have a server where your configs are stored. The agent could sometimes be kind of heavy because it's it's always running local, whereas Ansible... Um, generally, what people will have is a control host, as they call it, where you have, um, you know, the server has SSH, um, the client installed, and it just connects to the individual servers that you want to set up. So you have, have a web server, it'll SSH into the web server, it'll run the playbooks, which is what it's called. It's a configuration management link. Well, may, maybe not so much configuration management, but it is. It's its own language. It's kind of a long story to get into, but it's a it's a language that's understood and it's not specific to Ansible and it's easy to write in. Mm -hmm. And it's very logical too. I think most people can look at it and, and kind of tell what it's doing. They don't have to know a programming language. Is, so with that simplicity and the fact that it doesn't need an agent because it's just connecting to individual machines, I feel like that gives it a major edge over those other solutions. Mm -hmm. But on my end, I use Ansible pull, which is this additional binary that you get if you install Ansible. So if you have Ansible installed, you already have this. Then um, that's just a way of kind of doing the reverse where you're saying, I don't want anything to connect to my server. I want my server to pull down the configs and then run it against itself, which is effectively creating an agent system, let's be honest, which mm -hmm. kind of invalidates some of Ansible, but you still maintain the the ease of of the, the language of the YAML and how uh, lightweight it is, you, you get all of those benefits still with that method. So that's my variation of it, which I'll show off at some point when I get around to doing a NodeForge video, which is on my list, but it'll definitely be this year. And then what I plan on doing is just um, opening it up into um, public so people can just download it and just you know see how I configure servers if they're curious. Mm -hmm. So, well, what made you want to do this? And I guess also what made you want to do the Home Assistant stuff as well? So the first answer is YouTube. YouTube made me sure. get obsessed with configuration management because I had one computer when I started and I was getting really, really tired of erasing it, trying a distribution, installing it, putting all my files back on there, you know, just using this computer and just every week trying something new. I was a distro hopper by profession, I guess. Uh, it just got really old. So eventually I just wanted a way to reconstruct my setup without having to do any of the work. Mm -hmm. And that's where this began. So now it'll set all of my GNOME keyboard shortcuts. It'll change my wallpaper in GNOME. It'll change what's on the lock screen, all the configuration items within the GNOME desktop, um, pretty much right down to, um, trying to think what I haven't, like extensions are, are a part of this even. And then Mate, and then the Sway window manager is in here as well. So I have all these different configurations. So if I want to restore a system back to where I want it to be that is set up the way I want it, then I could easily do that. Now I have multiple systems and I don't have to do this, but then you know it became a business and now I have servers. So this thing I was using to manage my own laptops then graduated and became the software that basically runs everything. Mm -hmm. That's fair. And with, with Home Assistant, I think it's just kind of like the Star Trek effect. You know, when, when you're just looking at Star Trek, oh, wow, they can just talk to things and they have all these automated things. Wouldn't that be so cool? I think it's um, the, the child in me watching Star Trek that gets to play around with technology that is um, not nearly as good as it was in Star Trek, but even if it's 10% as good, as I guess I'll take it. 